had in the in the sort of the evolution of the tipping point, we had just some some mileposts along the way. Uh, there was Al Gore and an inconvenient tooth. There was the Stern report. There was some incredibly challenging weather. And then there was the International Panel on Climate Change. And we are blessed to have with us today a member of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize team that shared the Peace Prize with Al Gore. Uh, his name is John Fife. And in, in addition to being a member of that team, John has also been an author of the Arctic Climate Impacts Assessment. He is an adjunct professor uh, with the University of Victoria, and he's a research science with a scientist with the Canadian Centre for Climate Modelling and Analysis of Environment Canada. So, John, may I welcome you to the stage? We're going to have to try to see this a bit better. Do we need to bring the lights down a bit? Can you all see that, uh, folks? No. Oh, it's warming up. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Charlie. You seem to have disappeared somewhere into the ether. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you, uh, Severin, for the uplifting talk and the great uh, example, great youthful example, which, of course, is you know where our future belongs, is in, in young people, not old, you know, doom and gloom folks like me. Um, and so on the way over this morning, I was looking at the program, which, you know, looks really sensational. I wish I could stay the rest of the afternoon with you, but I can't. Um, the message I'm getting from the program, you know, what I'm understanding your job to be is to come up and discuss, you know, ways in which your school districts can become carbon neutral, which, of course, is what, you know, the provincial government says you have to do by, 20, by 2010. In fact, this morning I was at another meeting in the Premier's office to talk about climate change and about this carbon neutral mandate. So, you know, this is all very topical and, and important. My job, on the other hand, is con to convince you that this is a good thing to do. I mean, I'm sure you already all, you know, are convinced of this, but, it, you know, it always, you know, bears repeating. And I'm going to do that uh, in three parts. In the first part, I'm going to describe the sort of major dominant changes that have been occurring in the climate system, <clears throat> and that includes the atmosphere, the ocean, and snow and ice, you know, the physical part of our environment. In the second part, I'm going to try to explain why we believe these changes are occurring. And then finally, I'm going to describe what we think is in store for the future if we don't curb our, you know, appetite for, for carbon. So that's the overall, that's the overall plan. Um, now, we've already, you know, alluded to the IPCC. Everything I'm going to be talking about here basically comes from this famous report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It was uh, written by 150 lead authors, of which I'm one, uh, involved contributions from many other, you know, leading scientists uh, in the field. It took five years of, of work, you know, a lot of flying around and producing carbon dioxide. Uh, involved scientists from 130 countries and involved a very rigorous review process involving at least a thousand, a thousand reviewers. And it's been described as the largest environmental assessment of all time. And it's, you know, part of the reason why the IPCC, along with uh, and jointly with Al Gore, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, all to our surprise um, last year. So that's the, you know, that's where I'm coming from. And I would have brought the book if it wasn't so heavy, you know, just to show you. It's, you know, it's a great massive uh, piece of work. Um, so, so I'm going to start now describing these changes that we've been seeing. And it's useful to, first of all, you know, look back in time. Look at changes we've seen in the distant past to compare the changes we've seen, mo you know, more recently. You know, are they similar, dissimilar? What are the causes of these changes? And we, you know, to look in, you know, into the distant past, we do this uh, with ice cores, most famously the Vostok ice core. This is a research, Russian research station on Antarctica at that location. That's a picture of the station. And then below is an example of one of these ice cores. These are these great long, you know, tubes of ice. Inside the ice are bubbles, and inside the bubbles uh, is a memory of the, the history of the atmosphere, its temperature and chemical composition. And this is you know, a great uh, achievement to now have produced in the next slide this record of the chemical composition of the atmosphere going back 
650,000 years. And there's more information here than we need now. I just want you to look at the bottom curve, which is temperature and some funny units. And the only point I want to make here is that temperature or change is really the hallmark of the cl of climate. It is, has been changing, you know, for tens, hundreds, millions of, of years. And you can see that in this trace with temperatures going up and temperatures going down, taking us in and out of various uh, ice ages. Now, this isn't due to any, you know, human influence whatsoever. Of course, we didn't live back then. Rather, it's due to changes in the Earth's orbital parameters, that is, how close or how far away we are from the sun, okay? So that's looking back in time. And now we're going to, you know, zoom in to the more recent era. In this very famous picture now that takes us back 1,300 years, and again, it's temperature on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, and there are a whole bunch of curves here, each one uh, representing a different indirect measure of temperature. You know, we didn't have thermometers 1,300 years ago, so we have to instead look at you know, corals and tree rings, uh, ice cores and things like that. And each one of these curves represents a different way of getting temperature out of the natural system. And the only point I want to make is, again, change. You know, climate has been changing. A thousand years ago, we were in a relatively warm period, the medieval warm period. A few hundred years ago, we were in a relatively cool period, the Little Ice Age, you know, where Europe, you know, skipped a, skipped a summer. Um, and these changes, too, like the ones we just saw, are not thought to be due to any kind of human influence. These are variations that are due to changes in the solar output or changes in volcanic activity, changes in natural, you know, uh, forcing of the, of the climate system. Okay, so that, again, is, is looking back, back in time. And now we get to where we are now. Notable in this, in this, these temperature traces are what we see in the last 100, you know, 150 years with this, you know, rise in temperature faster than anything we've seen in 1300 years that, have ta that has taken us to a level of temperature that we haven't seen in 1300 years. This is, you know, of course, global warming, and this, we believe, is due to, you know, human interference. And now, finally, in my, you know, telescoping to the modern era, we have a picture of temperature since 1850 till now, um, recorded on thermometers, okay? So these are direct measurements of temperature, and you can see the temperature rise, you know, from 1850 to present, which is about one degree C. So that's a useful number to have in your mind, you know, kind of a takeaway number if you need one. I've superimposed on this graph, you know, a number of straight lines to indicate to you that with time, in the steepening of these lines, we have seen temperature not only rise, but accelerate, okay? So this is the worry. We are not only are we warming, we're warming, you know, faster and faster. And as I mentioned, and I will give you sort of the main pillar of evidence for this, this is due, we believe, very likely to human activity, all right? Um, where is this all? Where is this all happening? Well, here is a, you know, plots, graphs, you know, science nerds like me love, you know, these kinds of graphical displays. We have on left uh, temperature change over the last 50 years with red shades indicating warming and blue shades indicating cooling. And at the surface, you know, you can see they're primarily uh, red shades, primarily warming, okay? This is global warming. And on the right, we have temperature change again, but where you've averaged from the surface pretty much through the depth of the atmosphere, okay? So not only is the, the surface of the, of the globe warming, but so is, you know, the entirety of the, of, of the atmosphere. And so the point here is not only is this warming unprecedented in the last 1,300 years at least, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. That's the global flavor, the global flavor of the thing. Um, now, there's been, in, in the words of the co-chair of the IPCC, there's been an explosion of new information in the last five or ten years, which accounts for why I'm on this stage and, you know, environmental scientists are the new gods these days. It has to do with all this really hard work on the ground by scientists going out and collecting information from the natural system. And I have five bullets here, and in one slide each, I'm going to give you the scientific evidence for the fact that the oceans are warming, glaciers are retreating, and so on and so forth. So that's the plan for the next few minutes. Beginning with the oceans are warming, which is my own, one of my own, own areas of, of expertise. Um, 
we have a picture here of the heat content in the upper kilometer of the global ocean, okay, from 1955 until present. And what you want to notice is while there have been some, you know, ups and downs, not all of which we understand, there's been this general trend towards warming of the global ocean, okay? And so now this is fact and it has been established. <clears throat> it's also well known that about 90% of the excess or the new kind of heat that's going into the atmosphere has been going into the ocean. The ocean is sucking up, you know, a lot of this heat. And if it wasn't for that fact, we probably would have fried a long time ago. The ocean is really our, is our, great, uh, our great savior. And there are issues around, you know, is the ocean losing its capacity to suck up heat or is it, you know, gaining new capacity? And there's a debate in scientific uh, journals. I have a paper coming out in Science next week that will present one side of that argument and there's another one that has another side. So not everything is established scientifically quite yet. But we do have the fact that the oceans are warming. Next. We have that glaciers are retreating. On the upper right hand, I, I have, I'm showing you a picture of a glacier 100 years ago in Alaska with this tongue of ice coming down and meeting this moraine lake. And below, an updated photograph, and that glacier is more or less gone. As is the case for many glaciers around the world, they're either, you know, have disappeared or they're on the way to disappearing. And that's quantified with this graph on the left. So this is just length of these glacier tongues with time from 1700 till now at various regions, you know, through various regions on the globe, okay? And you can see there's been a decline worldwide in glaciers. And this is real, as, you know, Severin was saying with respect to some ecological parameters. It's true of the, you know, the natural system too. People have seen this within their lifetimes. People will live around these glaciers, you know, there's no question, something weird is happening. Oh, I've seen it in my lifetime with, the, with respect to the Columbia ice fields and so on. Glaciers are retreating. We have the ice sheets are melting. We have Greenland on the left, Antarctica on the right, with the blue shades indicating where these ice sheets are melting, okay? And they're melting kind of on the fringes of these major continents. And this is clear and unequivocal now. And in fact, since our report was published last year, there's you know been an accumulation of very strong and compelling evidence that there's been, there's even this is happening even quicker than we would have ever imagined. There was a, a, an article in Nature last week that came out, and it was on the you know, headline in the Globe and Mail. You know, so things are really moving, and they're moving quickly. Next. Um, okay, so what do we have so far? We have the oceans are warming, and that causes seawater to expand. We have the mountain glaciers are melting. That delivers water to the ocean. And we have that these major ice sheets are melting, similarly delivering water to the ocean. And altogether, in about thirds, we have sea level rise, okay? So sea level is rising. We can see that in this graphic here. Sea level from 1880 to present. And you can see this, you know, inexorable rise in sea level, a rise of about 20 centimeters. That's the length of my forearm. So this is not, you know, huge. It's larger in some places than in others. Um, but it's real, but it's not massive. I mean, we're not going to just, you know, self-destruct on the basis of a 20 centimeter rise. But the expectation is that it's going to rise more and more in the future, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then finally in this, you know, list of five biggies, we have uh, the fact that sea ice is melting. So this is a picture of the, of the Arctic, and this is a graph of summer sea ice extent um, measured in millions of square kilometers from 1980 till present. And you can see for yourself this decline in the extent of, of sea ice in the Arctic during the summertime. So we've heard a lot about this. We've heard a lot about this uh, for two main facts. And that one, the first one is it has opened up the possibility of a Northwest Passage, okay, which would have enormous economic consequences if that were to become true, and it nearly is today. And it also opens up the prospect of easier exploration in the north. So we have, you know, all these northern countries all queuing up, you know, to claim sovereignty on the north. Uh, so I was at a meeting somewhere and had a, a, a military guy, some, some colonel in the military, you know, describe to me these daily flights that the Russians are sending out over Canadian airspace. And the Canadians need to respond by sending up, you know, one of our two fighters, uh, you know, and ask them, you know, what... You know, what's up? What are you doing here? Go home. And this goes on now, you know, on a daily basis. And so we have that sea ice is melting. This takes us to 2005. 
2006, if I had the red dot to place on there, it you know, falls right off the stage. It's, it's unprecedented what happened in the last summer. So that's, you know, sea ice is melting. And now we turn to the second part of this presentation, and that is, you know, why is this happening? Uh, and this is the so-called, you know, attribution and detection problem. You know, scientists like these big, you know, phrases because it, makes, it look, makes us look, you know, really intelligent. Um, <clears throat> but the basic question is, why is this happening? Um, the way we get at this question is by using climate models. These are very sophisticated uh, computer models. They're based on sound physical principles, and they're validated in, in very sophisticated ways. They're run on supercomputers. Uh, climate scientists like me are the biggest users of computers on the, on the planet. You know, there's, there's really no contest. Every major industrialized country has a group like the group I'm in in Victoria, or maybe one or two, and we all develop these models and compete, you know, to, to produce the best one. They're run on supercomputers. We have a very big, fancy computer in our organization, as do, as do the Japanese. This is a picture, I hope you can see it, on the bottom. Those, that, those, uh, cluster, that cluster of 10-story buildings on the left is where the nerdy climate scientists work. The building on the right is the computer. It's the size of a football field, and it's powered by a, uh, a nuclear reactor. It's, it's massive. The, uh, the mouse that's used to uh, control the thing is as big as this table. <laughs> that's, uh, that's science, uh, you know, at, attempt at, at humor. That's why, we, you know, we, we stick at, uh, you know, we, we stick at science and, and stay away from talk shows and so on. But we have this, you know, this massive, this massive computer. And these, these uh, climate groups, uh, a few years ago, go, launched, a, you know, a set of experiments, each group in the world, and we all compared our results, and we produced this plot coming up now, which is really the cornerstone of this IPCC report. And what it shows you in the solid black line is temperature from 1900 to present, as it was observed, okay? So the black is the observations. And all of those red lines are the different computer models from around the world, okay, following these standardized runs. And you can see that the models closely resemble the observations and each other. So this is a very good thing. It tells us that the models are able to, able to reproduce the historical variation in temperature and the rise in temperature very, very well. Okay, so that's part of the validation exercise. The important thing is that this is not possible if not for increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. If the models did not have the fact that, you know, carbon dioxide is increasing in the models, they do not show uh, warming, okay? They show instead in the next picture here. So this is now the same experiments run where we excluded increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In other words, we didn't let, you know, carbon dioxide build in the atmosphere. And if that were the case, these models would tell us we would be global cooling rather than global warming. So it's really the separation between these red curves that show global warming and the blue curves that show that you wouldn't have it if you didn't have increasing greenhouse gases, is really what is behind the statement in the IPCC that it's very likely that humans were the cause of the rise in temperature of one degree C that we saw over the last uh, century. And we assigned a probability of about 90%. You know, it's 90% probable. It's, you know, pretty well certain that we were the cause of all of this. And this is why, you know, we're kind of organized today uh, in this room to address this issue. Um, and now we, you know, turn to the, to the future in the same way that these models can be used to look at the past, they can be used to look into the future. And that's what's demonstrated here in a, a graph that's more, you know, busier than it needs to be for what I want to say. You want to look only at, you know, one part of this figure, and that's, you know, go to 2005. And again, this is temperature change. Start at 2005 and follow the set of three curves that go up to the upper right-hand side. There's a a red one, a green one, and a black one, okay? So these are our model projections of what is in store for the future in terms of temperature. And the curves themselves differ in terms of the amount of emissions we project. One of the curves is a low emission scenario, one is a medium emission scenario, and one, one is a high emission scenario. And the point I want to make is that regardless of which scenario path we, we go towards, at year 2025, 20, we're going to end up at the same place. So we're doomed, okay? We have, we have stuck ourselves into a situation 
where within the next 20 years we're going to end up at the same place regardless of what we do. And that has to do um, with the fact that we've put enough carbon dioxide into the atmosphere um, that we have to live with its consequences for at least the next uh, 20 years and suffer another half a degree rise. Okay, so that's the doom and gloom and, you know, down part of the, of the presentation. Uh, the next bit, in an ironic way, is the upside of the story. And this is now where you look even further into the future. Let's go past 2025 and out to 2100 or thereabouts and a different kind of presentation, but the same information. We have three curves going from 2000 out to 2100. Again, there's a red one, a blue one, and a black one. And again, these represent low, medium, and high emission scenarios. And now you can see, when you get out to the end of this century, that the pathway that we take in terms of emissions will make a big difference. It'll make the difference between, at year 2100, a one degree rise, in the average temperature of the atmosphere, or perhaps a four degree rise if we choose a high, high emission scenario. And so the message here is that the choices that we make today will make a big difference by the end of the century. That is, within the lifetime of our children, and most certainly their, uh, their children. And this is the kind of thing, you know, that we have to, it's a long ways away, but we have to start making changes now. And in fact, by 2020, you know, the kind of canonical uh, thinking is that you, we need to have turned the corner by at least 2020. We have to have reduced, start reducing emissions. You know, we're on an uphill. We have to go on the downhill by 2020, or we may be headed into dangerous climate change, which is thought to be around, you know, the three to four degree temperature rise in the globally average temperature would re be a really bad place to be. Okay, next, uh, next. Okay, so now just in a few, and you know, kind of getting, getting to the end of this, this uh, part of the, of the talk, I'm just going to give you a sense of some of the things that <clears throat> we expect to see by the end of this century if we follow kind of a, media, a medium emissions scenario. Um, you should expect sea level rise. So this is pretty clear that the sea, the sea level is rising. It's expected to rise more, and by the end of the century, it's expected to rise about half a meter on average. It's going to be more in some places and less in others. And that's just reflected by the variation in shades here from blue to red. Some places will be impacted more than others, which is another message from the climate scientists. So this is it's a global phenomena, but with regional impacts. Different areas are impacted in different ways. Um, next. Expect, this is now temperature change out to 2100. The other thing you ought to know, if you don't know it already, is that the largest warming is reserved for land, unfortunately where we live, and at the highest latitudes, and in particular the Arctic. And that accounts for why we've seen such dramatic change in the Arctic to date, and why we expect there to be you know, even more dramatic change in the future. And it also accounts for the reason why Canadians ought to especially uh, take great interest in this uh, climate change problem. Um, Precipitation. So, you know, I'm you know nerdy kind of meteorologist guy, and I think, you know, temperature and precipitation are not these kind of sexy things like intertidal zones and so on. But precipitation, um, we have, you should expect regional precipitation change. In general, we expect uh, the atmosphere to become more moist. As the atmosphere warms, its capacity to hold moisture increases. So we expect a wetter atmosphere. But where that water falls out, is going to vary around the globe. And we expect in our region, uh, by evidence by these blue shades, that we will have increased precipitation over time. And where you see the kind of red, yellow shades is where we expect to see decreased precipitation. So increased precipitation at the high, mid and high latitudes, decreased precipitation in the subtropics. Okay, next. Um, so that's, you know, temperature and precipitation, the kind of mean changes. We also have a lot of new information about climate extremes, you know, weird weather. We hear a lot about that. We can now, you know, report on uh, climate extremes where we weren't able to report, you know, in years gone by. We have now information that tells us that when we get rain, it's going to be heavier. And this would be consistent, and it was shown in this graphic here. This would be consistent, for example, with what we saw last winter. I don't know if you remember, we had this, you know, sequence of you know, unprecedented uh, storms that brought unprecedented amounts of 
moisture very quickly, you know, and swamped out the reservoir here and affected our water supply. You ought to expect this to happen more and more often, these heavy precipitation events. Um, we expect there to be more drought. So in the summertime, for example, in, you know, southwestern British Columbia, we, would, we expect the uh, drought conditions to occur more frequently and last longer, okay? And globally speaking, this is consistent with what we've already seen. Uh, we've seen, for example, in Australia, you know, unprecedented drought conditions and wildfires and so on. We saw the Atlanta drought this summer. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but in Atlanta, you know, they're running out of moisture. When I was traveling in the U.S., this was the big issue. We had the California wildfires. We have all of these, you know, big news bullets. You're going to hear more and more about these things is what the expectation is. Um, connected with that, we should expect more heat waves, like the European heat wave of 2003. Uh, we expect there to be, you know, more and more of these kinds of events affecting humans and infecting crops and infecting the natural environment in many important and far-reaching ways. And then we have, you know, other aspects of the climate system. You know, I'm just talking here about the natural kind of physical part of the system, but there's the whole living part. And it's being impacted. I won't go into that. There's a lot of information out there to describe, you know, the impact of climate change on humans, animals, fish, and so on. Uh, we have, for example, longer growing seasons is, expect is what should be expected for the mid and high latitudes. This has to do with the rising temperatures and more and more precipitation, okay? Winners and losers, it is the case that there are winners and losers in this story. I won't go into any detail, but this relates to the fact that climate change in the physical environment is regional. It's different in different locales. Um, and then finally, the sort of three key messages for you. If you could take away three key messages. The first one is from the IPCC report that the climate has warmed. This is now unequivocal. Will continue to warm, this is very likely and humans are the cause. This is, this is very, very likely. We have that mitigation uh, will not substantially affect the climate over the next few decades. That relates to the fact that this cluster of curves just stay stuck together, as I noted earlier. But choices that we make now will have a big impact on the climate of the 21st century. So it does matter that you folks are, you know, assembled today to talk about going carbon neutral. We have to do that today, and it's only one small part of the equation and it's a complicated one. Thank you.